let's move on to one of the reasons of being here. So our first keynote speaker for the day will give his speech under the title, Time to Democratize Central Banking. And as Eleanor said, we'll just have the Swedish Riksbank has just given us uh, uh, some news this morning that they are increasing uh, the uh, rate of the rent. So. Uh, I think maybe we'll have some comments on this. But Eric Monet is a leading French economist and also author of the book La Banque Providence, Democratized Money and Central Banking. And Eric Monet and many with him, they point out that there is a need to include monetary policy tools in order to face climate change, of course, but also to, uh, to uh, make sure that the, uh, the affordable housing, the amount of affordable housing is growing. But since the central bank in very many uh, uh, democracies is an independent institution, it means it cannot be subject to specific political goals. So in his book, Eric Monet asks himself, should the framework for monetary policy and fiscal policy be revised? And is there another role to take for a central bank in an uh, economic crisis like the one we're in, where prices are, are soaring and, and growth is stagnating. So we're so glad to have you here with us. Please give Eric Monet a warm hand and the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much for, for the invitation. I'm really honored to, to be here today. I'm in the Arena ID and the Dernat Zukunft play a, a very important role, I, I think, in the, in the European debate on economic issues. And I think it's very nice that we also managed to have this, um, these discussions uh, in, uh, uh, at the country and also at the, at the, at the Euro European level today. This is highly, highly important, both on fiscal policy and monetary policy. So, as was said, I mean, this, uh, this talk will be mostly about central bank, uh, so not fiscal policy, but uh, as I will try to argue, uh, actually you cannot, although we over, uh, today think about the, the future of central banking, uh, the fight against inflation, financial stability, without rethinking about the coordination between monetary policy and, uh, and fiscal policy. So these are questions that I've been trying to to uh, discuss, not clearly solved, but for, for some years now, it's a very difficult question on how to, to rebuild a new framework for central banking that will be more, uh, more effective, uh, especially for, for coordination with other type of policies, but also more democratic, and I will try to see what I mean by, by democratic. So I do not pretend to have a, a yet clear answers to these questions, but at least I think it's very important that we bring these discussions forward of uh, how we can rethink the role of, uh, of this institution, central banks, uh, uh, today. So uh, on these pictures, I've so I, I, I put some of the of the text I've already written on this uh, on these topics. But uh, as I said, I mean my my thinking on this are really evolving. I mean, some uh, if you're interested, for example, on the on the top of of, of the of the screen, it's a, it's a special issue of a journal which is open access online. Uh, where many other scholars, lawyers, uh, political scientists discuss these new ideas and we have, I think, a very interesting debate on, uh, on how we can create a new institutional framework for, for the central bank. So, uh, at the start, I think it's still useful to, to, st to start from what was the, the consensus that has been put in place mostly in the 1990s about what central banks are supposed to do. Because uh, as we'll see, I think, I'm sure most of you are already aware of this, but that this consensus has completely vanished or exploded. So, but in some way, it still remains. So, what are, where are we are starting from? Uh, so, in 1990s, most central banks were highly reformed, both in law and also in terms of uh, financial operations, uh, with a primary objective, which was almost always uh, inflation stability of inflation, uh, inflation target, with one primary instrument, which was the interest rate. Uh, together with this instrumental instrument and objective, there was this idea that uh, the monetary policy was, could be quite isolated from the rest of other policies, meaning that the central banks could raise its interest rate, it would have effect on inflation, also on output, but beyond that, 
other effect on financial stability, social equality, and so on will be almost negligible. Uh, and for this reason, so everything makes sense here, for this reason, there was no need for coordination with other macroeconomic policies. I mean, I said that the idea was the central banks can do everything on its own, isolated from the rest of other policies, and without the need for interaction with other policies. And for this reason as well, I mean, central banks were independent, and so central bank independence is not new in history, did not it was not born in the 1990s, but there was a new definition of central bank independence that came during that decade. And the main idea at the core of uh, this new definition of central bank independence is that central banks should be uh, non-political. And the idea behind that, which was even explicitly someone said by, by some prominent economists, is that money is something too important to let to be led to to elected uh, uh, representative so the idea that actually central banks need to be a political because elected policymakers when they touch money they do only bad things with money okay and um and of course since there still need to be a justification for for institutional independence there was this idea that Still, the objective of central banks was decided by the legislators in a very clear and narrow mandate. And this is something that you will keep hearing uh, policymakers, uh, central bankers still say today that they will always tell you, we have a clear, narrow mandate. Our objective is only price stability. We don't do anything else. And our, our, our legitimacy comes from this clear and narrow mandate. So. Since uh, in the last 15, 15 years, we have seen that all these building blocks, blocks of the institutional frameworks of, uh, of central banks have literally exploded. I mean, we, we have seen that none of them no longer hold. Uh, so first, the primary objective of central banks, if you, see, if you exclude a little bit the last year, before that, I mean, what they've been doing in the last 15 years was not so much to care about prices, but really to care about financial stability. And so the importance of central bank has really been to act on the financial system and financial stability much more than on inflation, is the first thing. Second, regarding, interest, uh, regarding the instrument of the central banks, although interest rates are still playing a role, central banks have used many, many, many other tools in the last uh, 15 years. Some of them, have, uh, actually most of them, have been used before, so it was not an invention, but it was a rediscovery that actually monetary policy, financial stability needed much more uh, financial tools uh, by these institutions. So they've been what we call quantitative easing, so a, a purchase of, of uh, assets, private or, or public assets, targeting loans, the use of foreign exchange reserves to, uh, to act on the exchange rate, some swap line also to, to make uh, uh, loans with other central banks and so on, many, many, many of uh, these tools. Um, and we rediscovered that because of these tools, I mean, central bank's policy has many side effects on asset prices. When they buy a, a financial asset, it, uh, it, it raises the prices of assets. This have a, a effect on the wealth inequality, for example. This could have effect on access to housing credits. Uh, so there are many, many side effects. Another one which has been very important as well is the effect on bank profits. Because when central banks operate, they operate through the banks. I mean, they, they buy the assets of the bank and they lend to the banks. And there was this idea before that, you know, this was really n neutral on the profit of the banks. And what we have rediscovered is that actually when central banks act, this also have an impact on the profit of the banks. So whether it's a subsidy, whether it's a loss for the banks, all this issue has came up in, in a debate. Uh, the other thing which have been pretty obvious today that coordination with other policies actually is almost unavailable. Uh, it's been recognized, especially in the, in, the, uh, in the realm of financial stability. So there's been this new term called macroprudential policy, meaning that central banks could, regarding financial stability should cooperate with government to, uh, to enact new rules about, about financial stability. But if we look at uh, two other most pressing issues uh, today, climate change and inflation, I mean, you see, for example, for inflation, that in all countries, in all European countries, as soon as inflation started, it seems that everybody thinks that it was a government and fiscal policy in charge of inflation, not so much a central bank. So the idea that you can have an effect, and this will be discussed largely, uh, uh, widely today, on inflation, it's not only the role of the central bank. Uh, 
Also something which is very important, uh, so maybe it was especially strong in, uh, in the Eurozone, in the Euro area, is that central bank's independence became, so, sorry there is a typo on the slide, a, a way for policymakers to avoid some responsibility. So I mean that, you know, it, central, bank, central bank independence was not apolitical or neutral at all. It was also a way for central banks to say, okay, fiscal policy might be too difficult to implement, uh, too difficult to coordinate, so let the central bank solve almost all the problems, uh, you know, regarding public debt, regarding our, um, expansionary policies and so on. So this has become also a very strong political problem of the fact that governments are somewhat tempted to, to say that central banks could do most of, of the job of, of economic policies. Something we learned as well, so you see that the list is very long, is that central banks are not narrow at all, uh, mandates are not narrow at all. I mean, and actually, if you just need to look at the central bank's legal text, the law of central banking, you see that everything they are supposed to do is actually not so well defined. I mean, what typical example is price stability? You know, what does it mean in practice? Not even talking about financial stability. So uh, the, the mandate is not as we say, very now unclear, it's mostly incomplete, incomplete in the sense that there are many unforeseen contingencies, many things that the central banks have to react to big economic shocks, and the way they are supposed to react to that is not written anywhere. And, and the last thing, which has been also very important, and there's a huge literature by scholars, especially in political science, on this, that the accountability of central banks has been shown to be very imbalanced. So what, what does that mean? It means that central banks are supposed to report to the parliament, but when there are discussions between the central banks and the representative, you see that representatives are usually not well equipped to really assess the, the, what the central bank is really doing or for, to think about alternative policy. Uh, and in the Eurozone, for example, I mean, the consequence of that, to which I will return, is that most of the at the end, the ultimate responsibility for monetary policy has been left to the European Court of Justice, because in several instances, the, the Court of Justice, rather than the Parliament, was in a position to decide whether what the central banks did was right or, or, or wrong, which is a problem in itself, because the Court of Justice normally is not the institution that you will think is responsible for, for monetary policy or financial stability. So one question you may ask after all this long list of you know how you know everything we think was a stable building blocks for central bank's mandate have been completely uh, shaked in the last years. I ask you know why things have not changed so much, and I think it's interesting to think about that. That on one hand it's pretty obvious that there is a huge gap today between what central banks are doing and what they are supposed to do, and what the institutional framework. So why that, you know, has not been so many changes in that? So there are two paradoxes to, to think about it, and I think it's important to see this ambiguity if we want to, to move forward. So the first one is that although it's obvious that central bank frameworks need to be updated, in compared to some other policies, I mean, it's been quite stable. I mean, it did not work so badly. I mean, one typical example, if you go to the US during Trump, I mean, at the end, Nobody wanted to discuss the issue of central bank independence because everybody was saying at least there is something pretty stable happening here. And uh, in the euro area, you know, it was sometimes not so different. I mean, although many people have criticized them against the central bank, many people are saying, okay, at least there is something here that holds the euro area together. And this ambiguity that on one hand, uh, you know, many people are dissatisfied with the central bank, but that compared to the difficult political context we're living in, central banks have provided some kind of stability. Is a kind of paradox today that I think is, is difficult, makes it not sometimes easy to act and to, to, to think about what should be the reforms uh, also to do. And the second paradox, which is especially, especially strong, strong among uh, discussion among progressives uh, in many countries, that on one hand, we say that central banks have been too powerful in some way, that you know, when they have they bought assets, it had an, an, an impact on inequality, so there are many side effects. On, on, on the other hand, we say, okay, we, we should use them because they, they are powerful tools, for example, for climate change and so on. So it creates an ambiguity on you know, whether we should ask less or more for the central banks. And one way to answer this question, I think, is just to, to reframe the, 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 the institutional framework of the central bank and their democratic accountability so that we can both uh, 
you know, think about their side effects which are not desirable, and on the other hand, also ask them to, to take their part to some important issues like the, the fight against uh, uh, climate change. So in, in the debate today, I mean, it's a bit uh, a caricature, but we could say that all these debates, they are, they are known, I mean, uh, many people have put that in, uh, in the front of the scene, but there are broadly three different positions. So the first one, with, uh, which I will say is still quite dominant among my fellow economists, is still to hope that the world will change, will come back to normal after 15 or 20 years of a parenthesis, and then we can hopefully go back to the 1990s uh, consensus uh, through the Pre, which, which uh, existed before the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. So I think for many reasons, for the state of public debt and the financial system, for the issue of climate change, I really think this is an illusion. But many people think that what was the world we are living in right now is a parenthesis and that we should not to worry too much about these uh, central bank issues and we should go back to normal at some point. On the other end of the, of the spectrum, some people will say that you know, a, a solution to this issue is just to end completely central bank independence and to say that you know, the central bank should be part of the government, their balance sheet could even be merged with the, with the treasury. So this view has been uh, put forward I mean, with dif different nuances by many people, but in the US debate, for example, it's been really put forward by people uh, who, who are called MMT, which is Modern Monetary, Monetary Theory, and that's say clearly that actually we should you know, cut the separations between fiscal policy and monetary policy. And there are all, another third position, which is more the position with many other people that I defend, uh, is really to rebuild coordination between central bank and other public policies, but also maintaining the distinctions. And the main idea behind that is to say that actually it's clearer, it's both more efficient in terms of economic policy and much more clearer and legitimate in terms of democratic theory to articulate different institutions in a clear way. So what we need, we, we can't keep central bank independence, although we have to redefine it, as I will show. We can keep central bank independence, we can keep different institutions, public banks, central banks, private banks, treasury, but we need to rethink the coordination between, between these, uh, these institutions. But it requires to create a new democratic accountability, and I will give you some examples uh, before. So this position, as all middle ground position, is not always the easiest one to defend. I mean, in the, in the public debate or on social media, I mean, it's much easier to defend one of the first two. We, we make strong claims, but I think to be more uh, realistic of what we can do, and also because I think it's a better position. Well, I think the, the third one is still worth uh, trying to, uh, to build and defend. Um, so how we can do that? So I will briefly um, put forward three, I would say, new, new theme, new, new I, I will not, maybe it's not really a conceptual thing, but uh, Two, two, three ways to rethink this idea of uh, what central banks are doing, which I think is useful to, again, maybe not clearly provide a clear solution yet, but at least reframe the debate. So the first one, which I think is, is, uh, is been especially useful to understand the history of these institutions, but it should be uh, readapted today to the current debate, is this idea of credit policy. So not talking about monetary policy, but m talking about credit policy. So what does it mean? So credit policy, so I'm, I, I'm not saying that, but actually most, um, my first research uh, agenda is economic history. I, 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 most of my research work in economic history. And when I studied the history of central banks, I discovered that the idea of monetary policy, today we talk about monetary policy and fiscal policy, the idea of monetary policy is quite new. I mean, it's only 1990s, 1980s, 1990s that central banks say we are in charge of monetary policy. Before that, they were talking about credit policy. So what's the difference? That credit policy, so that the two main differences, that credit policy is something which is broader than central bank policy. I mean, we can define that actually the state, more generally, including government, even local government, and so on, are building something which we can call credit policy, and which is any kind of intervention in credit allocation. So it goes from banking regulation for, for example, housing policy in many countries, and including Sweden, uh, I, I know, that there are 
quite a lot of uh, government intervention in the housing sectors, from tax rebate to uh, subsidized uh, social housing, that have uh, quite a strong influence on the way that the housing market really work. And it can be also the same in, uh, in, in export policies. You know, also mo most countries uh, su will subsidize credits to export and so on. So there is something which can be called credit policy. And you know, among these large uh, terms of broad state intervention in credit allocation, the central bank is playing one role. So why is it useful to think about the central bank's policy into this broader credit policy? So first, because it's, it's a way to recognize that the central bank's policies will have non-neutral effects, that they have side effects on other uh, credit policies, other allocation. I was talking, for example, about commercial banks' profits. We should recognize that, indeed, when central banks intervene in the economy, it may have an effect on the profit of banks, which can be, you know, maybe uh, 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 offset by some regulation and so on. The so same for housing policy. We should recognize that when central banks intervene in the economy, when they raise interest rates, depending on the other housing regulation, it will have an effect on housing regulation. So wh why I think it matters is that it forces us to rethink the, the consequences of the policy of the central bank at the sectoral level and in their interactions with other, uh, uh, with other policies. So once you did that, when you recognize that the central bank is one part of credit policy, at the same time you, you are able to see the interactions between the central bank's policy and other type of policy. So it's, one, it's first one way to assess the interaction and side effect, and on the other hand to, to build much clearer um, uh, it's a much clearer definition of what the central bank can do and cannot do. And for the issue of climate change, for example, I think it's very important. We cannot ask central banks to, do, to finance all the climate transition. I think it's not their role. We, think we should think of other uh, uh, part of public policy to do that. But the central banks could have a, a, a also a role to play. I will come back to that at the end if I have time. So, it's, so the whole idea of credit policy is to make the, central bank much, the role of the central bank much more clearer in a, in a global, um, uh, uh, global uh, broader set sorry, of, uh, of state intervention in credit allocation. So the second thing which I think is, is important, and I should now rush a little bit, is on um, the redefin redefinition of central bank independence. So I know it's very contentious issues. I mean, some, a lot of my fellows on, uh, uh, we will think that we should really and central bank independence, I, I still think uh, it's still a useful notion. Uh, and independent institutions, I mean, are, are, are actually part of democracy. So the bottom line here is that we should redefine central bank independence not as something against democracy, as it was done in the 1990s, so not as something which is, you know, make here to, because uh, elected representatives are impossible to manage money, but as something that improves democracy. And so to, to think that, we should think about the balance of power that having an independent institution creates in the democratic system. And for this, we should recognize that central, bank in the, uh, central banks are not the only in independent institutions in the democratic system. We've got the, the competition authority, the media authority, okay, now we used to have in many countries, the media authorities, I will be sure that you know, there are not problems on the media, but should be independent for the government and so on. So there have been also a huge literature and political philosophy, political theories that I've reviewed in my work and used a lot to rethink the independence of some of institutions, but making, it, making them consistent with uh, democracy. And uh, so I, I have a, I'm running late, so, uh, but in a nutshell, I have to summarize this quite complex slide, is that, uh, the application to central bank, so may maybe the most easiest way to think about it is to think of the difference between the, the, the power of money creation and the, the budget of the state. That when the state, when the, the government presents the budget, the annual budget in front of the parliament, you know, the parliament decides on the budget. The, the, the central bank is an institution that have been created by states because states need more flexibility on the financial side than the budget. If the parliament votes on the annual budget, but at the end, the government can use the central bank to finance all expenses in a different way than the one which has been voted by the parliament, it's not something which is clearly democratic. So 
It's why, I actually, if you think about the central bank as an institution different from the state, either you say, OK, the parliament should all, all also decide on the central bank, uh, on, on the central bank loans and so on. And, and if you do that, this is just like if you're merging the central bank and, and the budget, and so you lose all the flexibility that the central bank is giving to state policy. And the reason why they were creating is to have this flexibility. So how you, either you give up on flexibility, or you give up on, on uh, parliamentary control. So that's why I think that thinking about the central bank's independence as a kind of new balance of power is still, uh, is still warranted. But this new definition I mean, is much more demanding in terms of democratic accountability that we have uh, today. For one reason, that it means that the central bank in, in this case, and like other independent institutions like media, comp uh, media authority, like Supreme Courts also, need to justify much more what they are doing. And this is what is really important here, that we should ask the central banks to provide much more justification of what they are doing, not only in terms of, uh, you know, putting different inflation targets, but also to be much precise about the interactions between their policy and the other policies. And, um, and, and it's why uh, now we're talking about potential improvements, uh, that one of the proposals that I have made, and again, it's really to, to put something in a discussion, in a debate, I mean, it's, it's not a, a final uh, proposal, is to have what I've called a credit council, which is uh, something that was um, that existed in the past in many countries, in, in some way, that, uh, by the way, in, in Sweden as well, which is an institution which is linked to the parliament, which is not an institution that takes decision, but who has a dual role. The first role is to be a, a forum for discussions about the interactions between the different legs of credit policy. Okay, this will be the, the place where, you know, people will say. What is the impact of the central bank's rising interest rates on the housing market? And whether we should adapt the housing rules on, ta housing, on special taxes, subsidies to uh, the, the policy of the central banks, or whether the central bank should adapt the policy to the other one. So this should be the place to discuss all the interactions between the different legs of credit policies, including the central bank's policy. And the second rule, will be to give more power to the parliament to have a more balanced discussion between the central bank and the parliament. For two things, it will give the parliament more expertise power, because now in every country there is a huge imbalance between hundreds of economists working at the central bank that can provide many scenarios, but when the discussion with the parliament, the parliament has not the tools to assess whether you know, the central bank is presenting scenarios which are really complete, which really take into account the side effects and so on. And the second, which I think is also very important in terms of democratic theory, is that this credit council could be sure that many interests are represented when we're talking about the effect of central bank policy. And I think that many, uh, you know, many NGOs, many people in, 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 uh, in civil society have opinion on the side effects of uh, central bank's policy, which are not well taken into account in standard models of economists. Okay, so it's not just like putting economists in front of one each other that you will solve the problems. You also need to create institutions that will be able to collect more opinions on the, on the importance of the central bank. So this is one thing. And the other one is also to build a more explicit coordination between fiscal policy and monetary policy. And my, my initial goal was to mix the two. And after talking to many lawyers uh, during the last two years, I think I came to an, an political theorist. I, I actually don't think it's possible to mix the two because fiscal policy remains the real of the government. And if you believe in separation of power more generally, you cannot at the same time create institutions that will give more power to the parliament and that at the same time will be an institution where you can discuss uh, coordination between uh, uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. So you need to separate the two, but I think they are not, uh, of, uh, you know, they are. They complement each other, that you will have this credit council giving more power to the parliament and discussing credit policy, and also uh, a, a, another way where fiscal policy and monetary policy should be discussed more, uh, more widely. We can come back to that in discussion. So one criticism that I, I think I need to end now in two minutes, one minute, is that uh, one uh, criticism that I uh, often received when I, I make these uh, proposals and discussion is that 
people say, okay, we, what you're proposing is just about talking more, you know, providing more justification, maybe even more technocracy, you know, more reports, more justification, and so on. So uh, my easy card would be to say, okay, there's a lot of scholarly work done by philosophers, and uh, they call that epistemic theory of democracy, which is a mean that actually Talk, talking more, providing more justification is better for democracy. But in, in, in practice, what, what does it mean? Okay? And, and I recognize that the risk of all this will be just to create more institutions, more, uh, and actually, instead of creating more democracy, you will create even more technocracy or just more reports that will be put in the, in the shelves of the parliament and, uh, and, and useless. So I think this is really not true, and if we take examples, so I don't have time to go into the detail here, but. For example, I made a proposal with uh, my colleague Jens uh, van, van Kloster on, um, on how using this kind of new framework will be able to build legitimacy for central bank interventions in, uh, regarding climate change. So in the sense of what we call green loans, uh, targeted green loans. So again, it means that the central banks will not replace a promotional bank or a public development bank. I mean, they will not just like try uh, choose uh, you know in what uh, uh, what would be the tenure investment that should be prioritized but that will make um, in the fight against inflation the increase in interest rate compatible with um, um, promoting uh, investments in uh, green energy so the main idea here is simple just to say that when we increase interest rate we, central banks is doing to do is doing this to fight inflation but at the same time, it may decrease investment in uh, green energy or in, in other green technologies, which actually will be useful in the medium term to, as a fight also against inflation. So if we want the central banks to really fight inflation in the long term, if we want the central banks to be really consistent, we need to find a way to isolate some kind of in investment, so give priority to some kind of investment that will be refinanced by the central bank as a lower interest rate than, uh, than the, other, uh, the other investment. And many central banks, including in Sweden, did this kind of thing for export credits until the 1990s, so it's not something which looks as uh, heterodox as it could be. Um, but for, to do that, and this is what we extensively discussed in the paper, you need a new democratic fr framework. Because otherwise, I mean, the central bank has no legitimacy to say, okay, what is green, what is not green. So that's why you need a, a, a new architecture where the credit policy of central banks will be articulated to other credit policies of the state. So in conclusion, I think we need, many other people think that, that we need a new framework for central banking. It's not only necessary for better democratic accountability, but I also think for better efficient coordination of monetary policy with fiscal policy and, and, and credit policy. I mean, in the past years, we have seen too many central bank policies which have a side effect that nobody can control and nobody is really responsible for it. I don't think it's good both for the economy and both for, for, and for democracy. And we should improve deliberation and parliamentary oversight as a way to improve this balance of power. And this balance of power, as I say, is not incompatible with a new definition of central bank independence. And last point, is that something I have not discussed at all today, but I think is still very important, is that I talk about monetary policy and credit policy of central bank, but central banks are also responsible for banking supervision. And this is a completely different topic, so which has uh, some similar conclusion, but it's, uh, it's another important thing to, to discuss. But uh, I think what I've said here is also useful to rethink the accountability of, of uh, central banks for banking supervision as well. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Monet. It, it, we would need a couple of uh, copies of you for the Swedish context, because I think there's many of us who have been thinking about these issues for the past yeah. couple of years, feeling that, oh, something is not right when the central bank are making decisions that are making, uh, affecting distribution and inequality mm. in a very unequal, unequal way. So you are pointing out a few roads or a few, you know, could we reach a new consensus? A twin, I'm dreaming about a 2030 consensus. So what would you say, uh, what scenarios do you see are actually likely? You are presenting many, uh, what would you say, likable options here, but what would you see actually could be happening in, in Sweden or in other Western democracies yeah. the coming decade? 
So something, a, a first point to answer this question, which I think is, is very important, is to recognize that the other consequence for moving from the 1990s consensus with today's world is that we, have, we gave up with the idea that there is one model of central banking. And this is very important because in the 1990s, that was also, since central banks were supposed to be a political, neutral, care only about interest rate, in that case, you mean, okay, the same institutions could be almost the same in every country, and this was what was supposed to be. And then in this framework where you care about the interactions with central bank instruments with other kind of current policy, then the, 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 the role of the central banks d became quite different depending on, on, on each country. And I think this is very important. And on this, we, we already in, I think we're already in this world where I feel the, the central banks of very different, now different countries are extremely different. For example, the fact that in Sweden, uh, the, you know, the issue of the exchange rate for the Swedish economy has become ex ex extremely prominent for the central bank. So even though there's no official uh, uh, peg, I mean, the, 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 the foreign exchange is not an official target for the central bank, the, the, the Swedish central banks are, are, are scared about this exchange rate because we know that it has a uh, side effect also on, on exports and also on inflation. So that's one uh, important, uh, important thing is how central banks now, again, I mean, and, and for the long part of history, this has been the norm that central banks care about exchange rates, but how we, do we account for that today? I mean, the other example, uh, for example, has been Switzerland, where probably most of the uh, issues of, uh, of the central bank in the last 10 years of, in Switzerland have been ab about exchange rate and more, mm -hmm. uh, more uh, recently with the banking crisis as well. Uh, so this is very different from what has been the case in the euro area, for example. So I think we are coming to this world where actually central banks have very different uh, objectives and, and very different goals according to the country and the other policies that take place in the country. So in that, and also the, the, what I also expect that what I was saying here about credit policy, that now we central banks and public policies more generally think more and more at the sectoral level, at the sectoral dim dimension. And I think this is, again, this is not new in history. I mean, if you go back to central banks uh, before the 1980s, it was very common to think about, you know, what is the impact of what we're doing on export, on housing, on uh, t several types of industries. And now this reflection of thinking at the sectoral level rather than the aggregate level is really coming back uh, in the discussion of a, of a monetary policy. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to the Swedish version. We'll have a credit council taking on the malfunctioning housing market. Yeah. So I was thinking that uh, for you to be a bit engaged, I want you to stay here on stage, Eric Monet, but I would like you to turn to your neighbor and maybe also get on uh, your feet so you get a bit of blood flowing. Talk to your neighbor and ask yourselves, what, what kind of um, uh, thoughts does this spark in us? So what does this mean for us in the Swedish? context and uh, the Swedish central banking. Uh, but don't leave the room. Please don't leave the room. Just stand up <laughs> and then you can pose your questions maybe to Mr. Monet. Dear friends, participants, may I now uh, draw your attention back to the stage. It feels like this topic of central banking and credit policy was really giving a lot of energy to, uh, to all of you. So I thought I have a couple of colleagues on this side and that side with microphones. So if anyone would like to uh, pose a question or make a comment on what we have just heard or maybe what you discussed in your couples, please just uh, raise your hand and I'll make sure. I think we'll take two or three uh, questions and comments at one time and uh, then uh, uh, Mr. Monet will respond. So we have a gentleman here and then a gentleman at the end. So please start in the front and then move backwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Monet, for a um, highly elucidating presentation. Uh, on your conclusions, uh, you don't conclude or comment actually on the objectives of central banks. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in the 90s, the objective was of inflation, and then we have moved into financial markets. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, the Federal Reserve has, or had at least, a double mandate 
uh, to um, look at inflation, but also to look at growth. In your view, would it be possible to discuss, to introduce uh, a component of growth into the objectives of central banks in Europe also? Thank you. And let's also pass the microphone to the gentleman in the back there, so we'll have that question at the same time. Thank you. Also, many thanks from me too. Um, I think those questions that you are discussing have very much to do with uh, uh, a basic uh, power balance between market institutions and political institutions. And uh, my discussion partner here said that what would the market say if you started to discuss that, initiated a discussion on those things? In Sweden, they, they are so used, the economic actors are so used to um, just have it their way. So that uh, <laughs> such a discussion, and I think that applies to Europe too. And I, I wonder about your reactions. I, I, I guess it's even more entrenched in Sweden, the, the sort of taking for granted that uh, the market has its way. Uh, and, and he asked, what would the market say if you really started that discussion? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Munay, would you like to comment on uh, these two questions? So on the, on the mandate, I think it's a, it's a very important question. So the reason why I did not talk so much about it is that I would say I'm a bit shared on these issues because uh, as a, I have studied a lot of the history of central bank and, and something you see that, to put it plainly, that the mandate does not play such an important role, not always. That you think, for example, about financial stability, it's not in the mandate. Okay, it's obvious today that central banks are doing something for financial stability. So there are many things that are not clearly in the mandate which are taken into act, uh, done by central bank. And this is why I think it, it's better to discuss it somewhere than just relying on the mandate. And on the contrary, in some cases, you know, having a mandate does not make it always uh, uh, clearer. I mean, the Bank of England, it was the parliament voted to inc inc introduce environmental objective in the mandate of the Bank of, the bank of England. It did not change so much because sometimes you, are, you, have a, you, know, you have a mandate, but the interpretation of the mandate is not very clear. And in the US case, I mean, the way that the, the president of the Federal Reserve have implemented, have, uh, sorry, have interpreted the, uh, the trade-off between uh, prices and, and output and, and GDP, for example, have been extremely different across the different people. So the mandate is important. I do not neglect the importance. And I think it's also, uh, have a, it's important because it frames the discussion in the parliament in, in some way, I mean, could frame. So, but I think that it's, Changing the mandate and the central bank law is clearly uh, is clearly not enough. I mean, and that's why I, I made all these proposals because there have always been, and I think there will always be quite a large discrepancy between what is written in the law and what and what central bank do. And at the end, what central bank do is to protect the value of money. I mean, and these have been the constant. I mean, what they are supposed to do. I mean, they, sometimes they don't do it. So, and the value of money, it's something which is. You know, how do you interpret that? Okay, how do you interpret the value of money? Is it the exchange rate? Is it only inflation? Is it in terms of financial stability and so on? And so this is why, you know, the interpretation of what is the value of money is something which is changing, and we just need to create a, a forum when, where this is more explicitly discussed. But I'm, I'm still open to the fact that changing the, mon the mandate is, is still important. And um, and it's related a little bit to the, to the second issue that, uh, of, of the financial markets. So, uh, you know, so central banks are financial institutions. I mean, the reason why we have a treasury and a central bank, the reason why states created a central bank is that you can do things with a financial institution that you cannot do with a state budget. And, and the implication of this is that, so the good, the good uh, part of it is that it gave flexibility to the state, okay, meaning that it gave them the, a possibility to react in a much uh, quicker way, in a more massive way that you could do with fiscal policy. The downside of this is that you have immediately an interaction between the state and the financial sector, 
which is very a kind of intrinsic, even kind of incestuous relationship between the state and the financial sectors. And the whole history of central bank is this history of very close interaction between the state and the financial sectors, which means that the way you define a central, how a central bank operates also frame the way that the, the financial markets do op operate and are regulated. And this is why I think it's very important for the democratic debate to recognize that the way central banks operate have an impact on, on the financial market. This is key, and we talk about the bank profit and so on. So you cannot just think about central bank policy without thinking about the impact it has on the financial market and whether you think it's legitimate that the central banks played a role in, in such kind of intermediation, whether it's legitimate that the, all central banks' actions uh, are intermediated through this uh, financial market and whether the financial market when they intermediate the central bank action, they may take a, well, COVID a, a rent or a privilege of that. Okay? And this is, for example, very important today on whether when central banks increase interest rates, what the banks are doing. You know, when they increase their deposit rate and credit rate, do they make a margin on that or not? You know, one example among many. And the other example was about asset prices. And made your question was more about the reaction of the market, that we, if we make these kind of proposals, how the market uh, will, uh, will react. And it's, it's here that you've, you've got still this ambiguity of the central bank that on one hand, it needs the, the market or it needs private institutions to work because otherwise you will have no action of the central banks. But on the other hand, the central banks can influence the market. And it's not true that the, just like the, the market are just, uh, you know, constraining enormously the central bank. I think that the central banks have and in some ways, they've shown that is in, in the last year, they have some way to intervene on the market, but to, if they want to constrain uh, the, 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 the market enough. So I think you should not take granted that for granted that the market is imposing huge constraint on, on, on the central bank and the market know exactly what they want uh, for the central bank. I mean, again, if you go back to history, this idea that there will be an institution that will set an interest rate, you know, it's, it's very strong economic interventionism. I mean, today it's interesting that it's linked to a uh, kind of neoliberal policies, but if you go back uh, or, uh, in 1920s, 1930s, and there was a lot of discussion by Swedish economists about, about this, the main idea is that you will let an institution decide on the interest rate of the whole economy, you know, it was seen almost as a, as a communist proposal. I mean, I'm not kidding. So, so you see that, you know, some things that we associate with, uh, you know, market uh, principles are not Im immediately market principles. So, uh, conclusion, ideas from the left can become mainstream. Is that so? Yeah, uh, uh, that's a good, good uh, summary. Uh, so, thank you very much, uh, thank Mr. Thank you very Manet. much.